course. It sounds like a dodgy bunch of superheroes or some weird metal band your parents used to love back in the 80s. But G-force is actually a term that refers to gravity and acceleration. It's what pushes you back in your car seat when your car is accelerating and is the force that stops us from floating up into space. Here on Earth, we're in a constant state of 1G. Some things can do higher G-forces, like roller coasters that can pull around 5Gs. And then these acrobatics planes, when they're doing dives and crazy tricks, can pull around 7Gs. The higher the G-force, the more pressure there is on the human body. High sustained G-forces mean that it can be really hard for our blood to circulate, which is why when a plane is diving through the sky, some people can faint, which is not cool if you're a pilot. Speaking of pilots, I'm here with Chris from Southern Biplanes, who is a super experienced pilot. Now, you're not going to faint when we're up in the air, right, Chris? Oh, I certainly hope not. How long have you been flying for? I've been flying for about 15 years now. Uh, I've got about 5,000 flying hours doing aerobatics and teaching people to fly. Chris, why is this called a biplane? Well, unlike the normal aeroplanes that people are used to, this aircraft has two sets of wings. So it's got one on the bottom and one at the top, and that allows the aircraft to be built a lot stronger and roll faster and make it more manoeuvrable. How fast does it go? So this aeroplane goes about 180 miles an hour, which equates to about 250 kilometres an hour. Can you explain G-force? Well, G-force is the measure of gravity. So when we manoeuvre the aircraft, we create G-forces as the aircraft changes direction. So at 4G, we feel four times as heavy as we do right now. So how does that translate in the plane? Every part of your body feels heavier and the blood comes down from our head towards our feet and it can create things like grey out and black out, which um, we want to avoid. So it can be hard to move your hands and your legs when you're in the plane? Absolutely, yeah. You try and lift your arms up when we go flying today, and you're going to find it really hard to do that. So do people actually vomit because of G-force? Absolutely, yeah. We've had a few people vomit. Uh, probably about 30% of our customers vomit, but yeah, it depends on the person. Everyone's, everyone's different. Chris, do you have a sick bag ready for me? Absolutely. It's the first thing I pack. I don't think I'll need it. No, you'll be right. All right, let's do this. Let's do it. I'm not scared at all, but I packed a spare pair of undies just in case. over the wings have changed and the nose can face down, almost like you're falling. Now we're going to turn around and go straight back down again and into zero G. Holy cow, I feel like I'm flying! And now we come. So the next thing we're going to do is call a spin. We can make your airplane free fall and rotate at the same time. All right, all right, here we go, into the spin. And now we go. My body feels so heavy. 
Yeah, how are you feeling, all right? It was really cool to feel the difference of how heavy you feel and then how light you feel, all so fast. So that's your experience up to 4G and down to zero. So it's quite a good uh, go for your first time. down it was really cool I felt so heavy and then all of a sudden I felt like I was floating it was really really awesome and I didn't even need my spew bag <laughs> I've lost this guy three times already the good thing is he doesn't make you feel bad when you lose but how does it work well there's a sensor just up there. It shines light down onto the table. The puck and the robot's paddle are made of a special substance, so it reflects light back to the camera. The camera is high speed and captures 167 times a second. All this information is fed back to the computer that controls the robot and it reacts. Think about your body like a computer. All that information comes in through your eyes, which is the camera, into your brain, like the computer, all the way down to your hands. And that's fast. A black cockatoo flying in the sky is a rare and beautiful sight. And from the ground, you can see the tail fanned out with a splash of red or yellow feathers. Now, there's a story that says when the black cockatoos fly from the hills down to the coast, it's going to rain. And that for every bird in the flock, that's another day of rain. I'm here in Centennial Park, where there's a flock of yellow-tailed black cockatoos, to find out if that story is true or not. To help me with my question, I'm meeting my friend John. He's an ecologist. Hi, Faye. How are you going? Oh, it's fabulous. I've got some yellow-tailed black cockatoos here. I can see them. They have a real screech, don't they? I love their call. When you see a big flock flying along, you hear them calling. It's, uh, it's spectacular. But sometimes when they're foraging, there's a whole range of squabbling calls that you can hear. So how many yellow-tailed black cockatoos are there in the park? It's winter at the moment and we'll see up to two or three hundred birds come in to forage on the pine cones. So we have a much larger number here in winter than we see through the rest of the year. This species lives in southeastern Australia, so they live in the hills and the coast. OK, so that part of the story is true. And they're travelling because they're looking for food. So what are they actually eating? So we found that the main thing they're eating in this time of the year is pine cones. Pine cones are an introduced food, but the native things would be banksias and hakeas, so nice, juicy seeds. And pine cones are really tough, but how do they actually get into them? Yellowtail black cockatoos have a really big beak and they've got really powerful muscles, so they are one of the few species that can crush into the pine cones and get those seeds out. OK, so John, the story that I've heard is that when black cockatoos are flying, it means that it's going to rain because there's some research to say that birds know when a storm's coming because they feel a temperature drop and they fly away looking for shelter. Do they normally fly in big flocks? Because that would mean a lot of rain. It varies. When there's a lot of food, you get a large number of birds in an area and you get big flocks, which is beautiful. But we also see smaller groups of birds and commonly mum and dad and their babies. We don't know if the cockatoos are moving in response to storms. Uh, we can use the tracking data to look into that, but we don't have that answer. OK, so my little story has some truth to it, but I think I'm going to stick to the weather report. Let's go and find some nests. Let's go. So that's a tree hollow, which all parrots in Australia nest in tree hollows. It's a very perfect looking hole though. Is it man-made? No, it's natural. So there was a branch there, which is why it's so round. And then that's fallen down and there's been some decay. So some fungi has been growing in there and eventually it's hollowed out. And now it's a nesting opportunity for something like a yellowtail black cockatoo. 
Wow, I had no idea that's how hollows were made. What's your favourite thing about these birds? I love their call. I love watching them fly in, in large flocks. But the thing that impresses me the most is their powerful beak. Thanks so much, John. Thanks, Faith. Coming up later on Get Clever, I see if I can beat the black cockatoos at their own game. I'm going to try and crack open a pine cone. Make sure you stick around for my <laughs> smash test. That was ridiculous. I don't know why I thought that would work. In the future, I predict that we'll be able to put on a jetpack and fly to school, zip across the city in a flying car, and of course, time travel. Do you struggle with even the simplest of tasks? Sometimes things just aren't the right side up. They're inside out and the wrong way around. And cleaning up your mess only makes it worse. If you identify with any of these, then I've got the solution for you. I've got some handy sized household hats that'll make sure you're never left looking silly again. Pancakes, they're my favorite breakfast food, but I hate it when they're not light and fluffy. How do you get light and fluffy pancakes? It's all about science. Pancakes become fluffy when there are trapped air bubbles inside them. To be able to get trapped air bubbles in your pancakes to make them light and fluffy, you need to create a chemical reaction. You need a leavening agent such as baking soda or bicarb soda, which will allow your pancake batter to rise. You'll also need an acidic agent such as lemon juice, vinegar or buttermilk. When you combine them, little bubbles of carbon dioxide are trapped in your mixture when you cook them, which makes them fluffy. This may look like a cooking show, but it's a science experiment. So here's what you'll need. Some self-raising flour, milk, melted butter, lemon juice, sugar, bicarb soda, and one egg. Step one, stir in your milk, lemon and sugar in a bowl. Stir your mixture until it's completely mixed. You can leave this aside for five minutes and you may notice that it may have curdled. Curdled simply means that it may look like it has little chunks in it. Step two, put your flour and bicarb in a bowl and mix together. I hope I get the science right and make really fluffy pancakes. Step three, combine all your ingredients and add in your melted butter and your egg. Whisk all your ingredients together, but make sure you don't over whisk because you don't want to lose all those beautiful carbon dioxide bubbles. Step four, time to cook. Make sure you get an adult to help you. Pour some of your pancake batter into the pan. When bubbles start appearing in your pancake, it's time to flip your pancake over. That's what we want, light and fluffy pancakes. That looks amazing. There, we did it. By using science, we made the perfect pancake. By adding a leavening agent and an acidic agent, we are able to get those little carbon dioxide bubbles, making our pancakes light and fluffy. Beautiful, let's eat. Mmm, that pancake is light and fluffy, and you can even see little air bubbles inside. on Get Clever, I spoke with expert John about the black cockatoo. So one of John's favourite things about the yellow-tailed black cockatoos was their powerful beak 
and they use that beak to crack open pine cones to get in and eat those juicy seeds. This is one of the pine cones that we found from the actual spot where we found the cockatoos and I'm going to see what it takes to get in too. I'm going to try and hit it against the tree first. So that did absolutely nothing. I have thought about putting it in my mouth and trying to use my teeth but it's covered in poo and I think I might lose a tooth. <laughs> that was ridiculous. I don't know why I thought that would work. Tin opener! Let's see what I can do with this. Actually, that's not bad. Kind of did something, but didn't really make a dent. <laughs> ah, nutcracker. This might do some good. <laughs> Nothing. Amazing! Next! OK, now we're in business. OK, there's little bits coming off, but I'm still not actually getting in. This is ridiculous. Oh, well, I've managed to squash the ends. That's about it. Next! Definitely don't try this at home. Yeah, I'm getting somewhere. OK, so as I was soaring through that, there's like layers of wood over the top of the seat. And the cockatoos were actually getting right in there with their beaks and ripping that right out to get to the seeds. Oh, a power drill. Again, this is definitely something you mustn't do at home. Always ask an adult. I've managed to go all the way through, but I still haven't actually managed to split it like the cockatoos do. Imagine having that kind of power in your mouth. Amazing. Even though we can prove the story about the black cockatoos being able to predict the weather, I have uncovered their other superpower, beaks of steel. I wonder if that's why they screech so loudly. I'll ponder that another time. OK, how am I going to get this off? How do flies' eyes work? Hi, I'm Bri the Fly Guy, and I'm here to answer your questions about how flies' eyes work. The fly eye is covered in basic lenses, about 6,000 of them. The images are really blurry, but they're spread across the entire head of a fly, and this gives them 360-degree vision. The fly's brain is actually able to stitch all these images together into a kind of fuzzy image. And a fly brain actually works really quickly and it can process these images really fast, where it almost looks like it's seeing in slow motion. This is why a fly... <laughs>